building. Um, Sim Lab services all of the health science programs, and so that's where I'm located. Um, this is Marianne Lancaster. I'll let you introduce yourself. <laughs> I'm the Sim Lab instructor um, under Leslie. <laughs> um, and I'm just going to be hitting buttons today. <laughs> <laughs> and this is John Shelver. Hey, how you doing? Respiratory care technology program director and I will also work under Leslie. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway, we're going to get to what we're supposed to be doing today. Uh, we're going to cover some first aid and CPR. And a lot of times people will think, well, I'm never going to use this, but you really never know. You just never know. And so I like to give you this information just so you'll have it with you. And that way, when you need it, hopefully you can recall it. A couple of objectives by the end of this presentation, um, you're gonna be able to apply basic first aid and skills to the following situations. Bleeding, choking, concussion and head injury, diabetic emergency, heat exhaustion and heat stroke, seizures, stroke, burns, perform CPR, and he's an AED. We're gonna cover all that 45 minutes, okay? <laughs> so we've got, we'll go ahead and get started. First of all, just some important information. This class is gonna educate you on just some techniques and actions that can be applied using knowledge only. So, you know, if I came in here and I taught you to use a whole bunch of equipment that you would never have access to, that would not help you or me or your patient. You can do any of this with just knowledge. So you're gonna be able to walk out the door and apply this if the situation needs, needs to uh, happen. Uh, you will not be eligible for CPR certification after this class, but if you are interested, we can get you connected with John and, and make that happen if that's something that you wanna do. And then for your reference, we're gonna be using information from the American Red Cross and then um, just for our campus, you know, the phone number, the safety phone number just got changed, 720 safe. So just um, that's gonna make it to where if you need help with something here that you don't need to call number one for, you can call it 720 safe. All right, so first, let's talk about bleeding. So when you talk about bleeding, this could be anything from minor to, to major, but we're gonna kind of focus on the major. Um, what you need to do, first of all, is quickly survey the area and see if it looks life-threatening. A uh, big thing is scene safety here. You've got to keep yourself safe. And, and, and I hate to say that, you don't want to sound selfish, but at the same time, you don't leave another patient in this situation. So make sure it's safe and then send for help and call, uh, call 911 first. Because when you start dealing with that bleeding situation, you're probably not gonna have any more free hands to call. Because what a bleeding patient needs is pressure. And you're gonna have to do that with your hands probably. And so you need to call and get help on the way first. Um, also, you have to think about disease transmission. Uh, you know, I hate to say that, but again, we want to protect you. If gloves are available, that's wonderful. If you can have any type of barrier between you and the blood, clothes, whatever, please use that because uh, you just never know. Um, if you've got big cuts and stuff on your hands or an injury, you definitely want to protect that. You don't want to get their blood on your injury because that could be not very good. So just make sure that you're, you're going to be as safe as possible. Come on in. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, what this person needs again is pressure, direct pressure to whatever is bleeding. And so um, if it's an arm or a leg, and you know maybe it's like a squirting injury or something you can use a belt so take your belt off and try to you know put it above above the area of the, the bleeding to try to stop the blood flow from that um, and then you can ask the client about blood thinning products there's a lot of people with blood thinners think about it all of your heart patients are typically on some type of blood thinner and there's a lot of heart patients in the south uh, there's a lot of heart disease, so think about aspirin, Plavix, and then there's all sorts of other types of blood thinners. And so if your patient is, is with it enough, just say, are you on any blood thinners? Because that can help you make a decision on, am I fighting a losing battle? You know, am I, do I need, I need help now? Or, you know, am I potentially, is this patient fixing to try to clot, you know? Or, or just knowing if they're on blood thinners is going to help you. 
All right, next is choking. So what is choking? Now a lot of people, there's a there's kind of a misconception about choking. If you're coughing, you know, I'm choking. You're, you're not, you're not choking if you're coughing. Coughing is a good thing. I'm not gonna worry about you if you're coughing. You, know, you probably got strangled really good, but um, now if you're not moving air, if you're not making a sound, that is choking. So again, if the client is coughing, they're okay, they're moving air. If they're not making a sound, they can't talk, they can't speak, if they're doing this, that's the universal choking sign, then the airway is obstructed and they need help fast. Okay, so we've got three different types of people that need help. Adults and children over the, older than one year. You're gonna get the five black back flows in between the shoulder blades, so just, John. <laughs> so the, that would be, the five <laughs> back flows would be for the, the yeah. infant, yeah. And, and you can do, oh yes, I know the, um, yeah. So the, if you had an infant, you, sorry, okay, error. you would do five back blows and you know, you'll never, an yeah, for an infant. So I, there's two times that I've had to do one CPR and one choking. My daughter, she was maybe a little over a year and it was, it was like nonchalant for me. I'm looking back and I'm like, why didn't I freak out? Anyhow, if you, you know, they have those high C or those fruit drinks with the straws attached and that little plastic thing attack, you know, that's the straws. Well, she got that out and she was choking on that and she wasn't moving any air. So I was on the phone and I was looking and she was no sound. So I started doing this and then you do the five back blows and the five chest thrusts. And I saw this little thing and I pulled it out and then she started you know, crying and moving air and stuff like that. So this one, if I got a little, if I got, you're gonna put the, your fingers like that, and then see that black thing came out. So it's gonna be five back blows. So, I got about, you know. so you're gonna do five back blows and five chest thrusts. And what's interesting when we get into CPR, and I'll just jump in, the five chest thrusts are the same thing that you would do in a CPR in an infant, okay? So, yeah. And so also let gravity help you. Yeah. Don't don't hold this baby like this. I know you don't really want to hold your baby upside down, but let gravity help you because you need this blockage out. And so, I mean, it's hard, you know, firm pressure. Don't We don't need this because the pressure and the vibration is what's going to be used to dislodge what they're choking on. So, I mean, firm thrust and then flip back and then do your... And you keep doing that Just until precious. it comes dislodged. And if it if it doesn't become dislodged and they go limp, then you just go into CPR. You mm -hmm. put them on a flat surface and you do CPR. When you're doing the chest thrust on the baby, that's gonna help move air out and hopefully dislodge whatever obstruction. So, and then for the, oh, go ahead. Yeah, um, for anybody who wants to practice our choking baby, we've made it choke again. So y'all can just again, let gravity help you. And there it came. So there you go. And you never, you never try and do a blind, it used to be a blind finger sweep, but you don't yeah, do that because you could push it back in. So if you see it, you can get it out. Right. Um, also going back to adults, um, the Heimlich maneuver. So your fist right above your belly button and then your other hand and you're just kind of pull it up a little yeah. bit on that. I asked Tiffany to come and help. I'm going to do it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, so you ain't going to do it on. And so you would do that right your you get your thumb like that and then right under the belly button right there and then you're going to move it up, up and over. Yeah. If it's a pregnant lady or someone that's obese, you're going to go above their belly, especially if they're pregnant, you're not going to push on that baby, but you're going to go right below the breast and just push on that. It's kind of like chest thrust you're doing. Mm -hmm. If you're by yourself, and I didn't, I had a good friend of mine, his dad was choking and he was home by himself. And what he did was he got the end of a table, a chair, so like a chair right here. If you're by yourself, you could do like that. And that'll help move out that obstruction, hopefully. Yeah. Any type of chair by anything that you can push yourself against to try to get some pressure up there will help you get yourself from not choking. All right, any questions on choking? Next. 
concussion and head injury. So what is a concussion? Because we hear that term a lot, but that's basically when a person suffers like a hit or a blow to the head and the brain's kind of shaken inside of the skull. Um, signs and symptoms are dizziness, loss of consciousness, headache, confusion, they become nauseated, blurred vision, no memory of what happened. And so the treatments just kind of apply a cool compress to their forehead or, you know, their head, and then they need to just kind of rest. They need to chill out. You know, a lot of times we hear it from like sports injuries and stuff. They don't need to go back in the game. They need to just rest. Um, and you need to monitor them, stay there with them. Uh, you, you, you know, if you've got like uh, students with sports, you know, the parent does need to be called. Um, 911, potentially, it's kind of, you know, you're always safer to call, um, but you would definitely want to call if they had a change in behavior, if they became unresponsive, uh, have a persistent headache that just will not go away, or a change in vision. Um, and also, if they, if they happen to fall, if it was greater than two times their height, they definitely need to go to the ER and just get checked out. So, um, but you never want to leave this person alone. Just say, okay, you seem to be okay and we're going to go alone. So, they need, somebody needs to be with them for the next several hours just to kind of watch them to make sure everything is okay. Diabetic emergency. This is something that's a little bit tricky. Um, we have to err on the side. Come on, man. Um, we have to err on the side of being low because that's what we see most of the time. But in a diabetic emergency, it's when you've got issues with your glucose level. And just just so you'll know, I and mean, you don't have to, to take this out with you, but just so you know, hypoglycemia is low glycemia or uh, on a low glucose level, and that's going to be less than 70. Um, hyper, it, it really depends on when you ate. So don't don't say, well, they said. 180 was the number, it, it, it fluctuates because when you eat, it's going to be higher. And then when you are, you know, haven't eaten for a while, you know, that number would be lower. So this number really fluctuates, but um, over 180 would, would be considered high in, you know, relatively. So signs and symptoms, whether you're too high or too low, are very similar. And that's why this one's so tricky if you don't have a glucometer to take your blood sugar or to take this person's blood sugar. And so um, both of them are serious, but we want to treat it first. If it's too low, we just, we err on the side of being too low because a lot of people are on insulin and it's not necessarily that you took your insulin and you didn't eat. Maybe you did eat, but if you're stressed out and your body's going to metabolize that food quicker and so your blood sugar might drop. So. It's not necessarily, oh, you took your insulin and didn't eat. So don't always think that. Also, if they're sick, um, your blood sugar does crazy things when you're sick. You know, the stomach virus or just, you know, just sickness in general. The blood sugar will kind of go crazy. So it could go either way. Signs and symptoms of both of them are going to be clammy skin, sweaty, drowsiness, confusion, weakness. They feel like they're going to pass out. There are changes in their consciousness or their mood rapid breathing and dizziness. Uh, one of the big differences in hypo and hyper is their, their breath is kind of fruity smelling a little bit sometimes, but I know you're not going to want to smell their breath, so <laughs> you know, you just take that and throw that information out. But anyway, um, that's, that's only like one of the biggest differences. If you can't measure it, you're not really going to be able to tell. So you kind of err on the side of it being low and um, you would give them something sweet to eat. We need something that's um, very easy to digest. A crushed hard candy. Why would we not give them, just like, here's a peppermint. Mm -hmm. Sure. They might choke. So and then you've got a whole other situation on your hands. <laughs> um, Skittles, they're really sugary, easy to, to digest. Fruit juice, like orange juice, apple juice, any of that's full of sugar. Uh, regular soda, of course, you don't want to give them a diet because a diet's not going to have the sugar that they need. So, of course, water's not going to help either. So, those are the things that should help. Now, this should resolve in a few minutes, like probably 10 minutes or less. They should be feeling better uh, if this is low or if this is what's going on. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, if they eat something, they're like, yeah, I'm fine. My sugar was just low. I'm going to go on. And, and that's fine, but if they can't 
get back to their normal, they probably need to, to go to their doctor, call them or something like that. You can talk to them. A lot of diabetics know their body and they'll say, you know, I'm not feeling right, you know, can't get better, you know. They would say call, or maybe they can't say call, but if you can't see them getting resolved in about 10 or 15 minutes, then they, they need some more help. Um, all right, next, heat exhaustion and heat stroke. So we live in the South, and it gets very, very dangerously hot here. And so I thought this would be a great thing to cover because we could all really be in this situation if we are out in the hot. You know, a lot of us work outside in the yard or whatever, and we can get too hot. And so I wanted you to know that there's two different things here. There's heat exhaustion and there's heat stroke, and how to recognize each one because they're very different. Heat exhaustion is your, the loss of body fluids through heavy sweating. Um, sweating is a good thing. You know, we, we don't really like it. I mean, it kind of you get drenched and your hair looks terrible and you smell bad and all that. But sweating is a good thing for your body because that's how it cools itself. So um, the signs and symptoms are um, moist skin, your pale, flesh color, or flesh color. You could go either way. Headache, nausea, dizziness, weakness, exhaustion. Um, the treatment, get in a cooler place. Get this person in you know, a cooler place. Like they're out in the garden, they need to be under the shade tree or get them in the house if you can. Or, you know, you want to take off some of their clothes that, you know, maybe they're wearing two shirts or something. Get them cooler. Uh, take anything that's tight fitting, like a belt or anything, you would take that off. You want to get this person cooler. You can put like wet towels on them. Like just sometimes, um, when I get too hot working outside, I just put a cold bath rag, you know, on the back of my neck or, you know, maybe on my stomach, just lay there and just cool off because you, you just have to get this person cooler. Um, so, you know, to drink water, now you don't want them to chug like a whole bottle of ice cold water all at one time. Just get them to, you know, sip on it slowly. A lot of people will do Gatorade, Powerade, things like that. If they like that, that's a, that's a great choice. Um, if they don't start feeling better pretty soon, then they are going to need 911 to get some help. Um, it should be, you know, give them, you know, 30 minutes or so. If they're not starting to cool down and feel a little bit better, then they should, they should get them some help. If they start vomiting or this patient declines, definitely go ahead and call 911. You need to get them help. Now, heat stroke is a life-threatening condition. This is, can be very deadly. Um, this is where you are no longer sweating. So if you come up to a patient or a person, friend, neighbor, your family member, and you know they've passed out outside because they've been working, cleaning out the swimming pool or something, and they're no longer wet with sweat, call number one. They're having a heat stroke. Their body, their brain is not able to cool itself any, anymore. They've got to get help and you've got to get help fast. And so that's the thing. If they're ever not sweaty, that's your, that's your key. Um, move them to a cooler area, call 911. You know, again, put the cool towels on them, the wet towels, uh, monitor their breathing. Probably don't want to give them anything because they've got to go to the ER. You don't want them to aspirate if you try to give them water or something because they may not be fully conscious and fully able to swallow. Think about when you swallow or when you're giving people something to drink or eat and they're not fully with it, it has a potential to go into their lungs and aspirate and then you get pneumonia. So um, mm -hmm. just think about that when you're trying to encourage people to eat and drink. Seizures. I feel like we're seeing more seizures now. And I don't I don't know why. I haven't done the research why, but I feel like this is becoming a little bit more um, common, especially for like students and things. And so I threw this up here just so that you'll kind of know some safety tips on what to do, what not to do. Ease the clot to the floor. Um, because they're, they're probably going to end up falling or, you know, hopefully maybe they're sitting and we would just kind of guide them to the floor. 
because that's what we need to do because they don't need to fall and hit their head and then have another injury on top of what's going on. Um, their airway. So it's likely this person's going to start maybe vomiting. Um, so turn them on their side if you can. So the vomit will come out because what you don't want it to have what to happen is it to stay in because they'll probably aspirate it and suck it into their lungs. So turn them on their side would be a great thing. And then privacy. Um, having a seizure is is not your best moment, you know. Um, a lot a lot of things can happen. Vomiting, a lot of times they will uh, void or go to the bathroom on themselves because you can't, it's hard to control um, body fluids and things like that. So you want to provide this person privacy. If I had a classroom full of students, I would get them to exit into the hallway. So it's just me and this person and, and you know, get your classroom to go get help or call or something, you know, so you can be with them or uh, you could use your cell phone or whatever. But um, make, making this very uh, a private moment because a lot of times, like I said, you don't, this is not their best moment and just try to uh, keep it as, as minimal people in here as possible. Sometimes, you know, you might have a student tell you, I have seizures and you know, this happens and blah, 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 and they'll kind of guide you on this is what to do. If that's the case, then, you know, that's the moment. If they, they'll have the seizure, it'll be over. And then you just kind of monitor them afterwards. A lot of times they might be a little stunned and not, sometimes they may be able to just pop right back and talk to you and say, what just happened or you know it kind of depends on the situation if they are instantly back to normal and this is something that they have then it, it's probably okay if they are good and they say i'm fine and you know you know that this is something that they have but if this is something that you don't know anything about you don't know any of their history or if that person is not acting right you need they need to go to the hospital and so um Call 911 if the client does not have a history of seizures, if it lasted longer than five minutes. If the client is injured, maybe they did fall and hit their head. And so that could be another issue that, that needs to be seen about. And then if the seizure is unusual or if the client is not back to themselves after the seizure. Okay, stroke. Um, I we doing on time? Okay. Um, you have to think fast with stroke. So I want to tell you about two different types of strokes. Uh, there's hemorrhagic strokes and there's thrombolytic strokes. The hemorrhagic stroke is a bleed. So something has caused a bleed. Maybe it's um, fatal and hit your head and you're bleeding because uh, it's injured in there and so you're bleeding out into the brain or the spaces. Uh, it could be a thrombolytic stroke. That can be plaque, it can be clot, um, so there's two different types of strokes that are treated very differently, but their symptoms are very similar. Really the only way we can tell how you had a stroke or which type is the CT of the head. So we kind of treat it the same way. They present the same type of symptoms usually. So you have to think fast. Face, symmetrical. So if I, you know, if I think you're having a stroke and I might say, hey, will you just smile at me? And if one side is going up and the other side is not, that's a sign for a stroke. So you need to be very symmetrical with your face. If one eye is blinking good and the other eye is not blinking well, that's, that's a, a problem with your symmetry. So think stroke. Arms, ask them to raise both arms like this or like this or however. You just want them to do something bilaterally to see if it's equal. If it's like that, you know, if there's a problem with the symmetry, then think stroke. Speech. I might say, hey, tell me my name or tell me your name or, you know, can you tell me this sentence? The sky is blue. Just get them to say something that's not hard to say. <clears throat> and if you know, they won't be able to speak, they might say something that's very garbled and mumbled. Uh, they might say a few words, but might kind of mumble over them. Think stroke. Time. Note the time of when you found the person or when they started developing symptoms, because that time 
is very important in determining the treatment for this patient. Should I give them an aspirin? No, because you don't know which type of stroke they have had. And the only way for us to know is the CT of the head. So don't give them anything. They don't need to eat, they don't need to drink. Because if you've had a stroke, you're probably gonna have swallowing problems. And I certainly don't want to give you something and then you aspirate in your lungs and have pneumonia. So don't give them anything to eat or drink. Stay with them, call 911 and note the time. Okay, any <coughs> questions on that? Burns. How many people have been burned? I've been burned. <laughs> not bad, not bad at all, but I've been burned and it hurts so bad. And so um, this is key for ourselves. This is key for our kids, uh, for anybody. Anybody has the potential to be burned. You know, if you're cooking in the kitchen or if you're outside working with tools or whatever, anybody, you know, anybody could get burned. So one of the big things is, you know, it could be small burns, like I've burned myself in the kitchen with a hot pan before. It could be something small like that. It could be something huge like a house fire. So look at your scene and make sure it's safe. You know, if we're looking at a house fire or something like that, is it safe for you to go in? You know, where's the client? Think about things like that because you, you don't want another patient. And if you're that person's only help, then you certainly don't need to become a patient as well. So check the scene, make sure it's safe. Move the clot to a safe area. So maybe it's uh, like a burn pile, they're burning something outside, get them away from it. Uh, I've taken care of patients with those um, fish cookers and turkey cookers. It's amazing how many people get very severe burns with those. Get them away from the area so that nobody else is gonna get hurt with that. Um, so get them safe, stop the bird. That's the first thing. Get the, get, be safe and then stop the bird. If you've ever had a bird, or I know with me, it kind of still feels like it's burning. Even after everything's gone. I don't know if anybody's experienced that, but I'm like, it still feels like it's burning. So you want cold water on it. Cold water is the best thing you know, in a home environment or whatever. Um, to get on there and, and you just want it constantly on there because you want to stop the burn uh, and get this area cooler than of course what it was. And you can run that water 10 minutes or so because like I said, through personal experience, it feels like it's still burning. And so that cool water will be soothing to them. You can use a cold compress. You don't really want to use ice, um, but like just a cool compress do not try to remove any of burned jewelry or clothes or anything because that can further the injury. You need to get to the ER, let them take care of that. Um, if you do put a dressing on it, this, this is very helpful because um, I've had to deal with my kids and my family members and myself. If you put a dressing on there, it needs to be non-adhesive because when you stick that dressing on there and you made it all pretty, and then it's the next day and it's time to take it off and you just take it off what's it gonna do it's gonna stick it's gonna stick to it so a lot of times you know there there is a prescription cream that you can get um if you contact a healthcare provider via like silvadine cream you can put that on there and that will help it not stick you can also put like some vaseline but you want to make sure um, that this area does not get infected. So you have to watch it very closely for infection. So you may want to talk to a healthcare provider about getting some type of cream or something to make sure you're not going to get infected and uh, will help with the burn. So just be mindful. You can't just put a bandage on it because when you take it off, it's just going to rip it off and it's going to be terrible. So um, if that did happen, you can soak it in like some saline uh, that would be my preference, but if you don't have anything, water, just you know, as clean as you can get water, soak that uh, area in that so you can slowly peel that bandage off. If somebody did put it on there, now you're not just ripping the whole top off. That's going to hurt so, so bad. Um, you do need professional care when a child has been burned 
uh, when the burn blisters, the burn affects more than one area of the body. The burn covers hands, feet, joints, face, neck, or genitals. There's a large surface area of the trunk or underlying tissues are visible. One key thing with burns is there's going to be swelling that's going to follow because the tissue is damaged. And so when I think about burns, I do worry about airway. I mean, not if I burn my leg, but anything right in here, if I burn myself, there's going to be swelling. And so you have to think, is that close to their airway? So like if their face is burned and you worry about, you know, possibly the burn going in the nares and swelling. So just have that in the back of your mind uh, when you're thinking about what should I do? Call it on the one's definitely gonna be your best bet. Excuse me, bet. Um, just to get them checked out, make sure it's okay. They may monitor them for a few hours to see if, how much they're gonna swell. Depends on where the burn is and how much they've burned and all that. Also, they're going to get dehydrated if it's a large surface area. You have to worry about hydration with these patients. And so, um, if it's a pretty big burden, you may just want to go ahead and call. Okay, any questions on that? All right, we're going to transition to CPR. Got a little video for you. This is what you don't want to do during CPR. Maybe some of you have seen it. All right, so, so CPR, um, the, there's a good app that I found and I shared with Leslie and Marianne. Um, it's called First Aid, and it's through, it's a Red Cross, and it's really good. It has um, basic information on everything First Aid, pretty much everything we ta that Leslie talked about, and then also CPR as well. But the main thing you want to do is if someone is 
unresponsive, or if you come upon someone, you want to make sure they're unresponsive. So, you know, are you okay? And if they don't respond, or they're not breathing, you got to jump right into CPR. So in the past, it used to be, you do compressions and do breathing. You do compressions and do breathing. But now, if you don't know CPR, or it's a lay person that has no training or anything, you can just do compressions. Because what's happened to this person is they stop breathing and their heart is stopped. So now you got to pump the blood, okay? Um, and for CPR, comp doing compressions, we're going to show you, I'll show you on adult, and then also this could be a, a child one year age and older, okay? Um, you want to, again, call 911, assess them, see, are you okay, are you okay? If not, have someone call 911 or you call 911, okay? For a child that's one to 12 years of age, um, you're gonna compress about two inches. So when you're compressing, sometimes these have a click, but yeah, so you can hear the click, okay? So when you when you do compressions, you lock your arms together. You don't want them to bounce back. Okay, so you got you're right above the patient. So if I'm on the ground with them, I'm right above them, and I'm just going to keep compressing. Okay, at least 100 to 120 uh, per minute, and you're just keep keep going, keep going, keep going. If someone else comes and says, "Hey, I know CPR," all right, let's switch. After two minutes, you can switch, okay? So for a child, it's about two inches. For an adult, you're gonna go two inches, okay? Don't worry about, you may feel some ribs crack, that may be normal, okay? Um, and you're gonna compress the same rate, 100 to 120. You're gonna let the chest rise completely. So if I'm doing this, I'm gonna let it rise completely, so I'm not gonna, not let it rise because I'm not doing it properly. Because what's happening is when I compress, I'm pushing that blood. When I let up, the blood's coming back to the heart, so I'm pumping it, okay? Um, yeah, continue until help arrives or you're exhausted or someone else. Higher level of care, if you call 911, the paramedics or EMTs come, that's higher, higher level of care and you can do that. Um, and then you can switch out if possible. Now, just like the choking for my daughter, that's, that's one time I had to do it at home. There's one time I had to do CPR outside of the hospital. And it was my neighbor, it was about 1030 at night, and my neighbor, he lived with his grandma and she was like 90. And he was like, I know you know that he knew me and my wife were in the medical field, so he called us and said, come and do it. And I told my wife, get out of bed, we gotta do CPR, and this poor lady. I get to her room and she's dusty gray and he's on 911 and I, I knew that it's too far gone, but 911's like do it. So I was doing compressions on her and I could feel the ribs crack and everything. And a few minutes later, the paramedics got there and they put this thing on her chest that did compressions for him. It was like some hardcore stuff, but it did compressions and stuff. I'm not sure it's a compressor or whatever. That way they didn't, they didn't have to do it. Um, if, I know like if, if there is a barrier, if you wanna do breathing, you can, but as long as you do compressions, you're good, okay? I had some students ask me in our program, do I have to do it outside the hospital? Do I have to, you know, will I get in trouble? There's law that's good Samaritan law, okay? As long as you're doing what's good for the person, they can't come after you and say, hey, I'm assuming you broke my chest and you gotta pay for these medical bills. No, because you can't do that. That's good Samaritan law, so we tell, us, tell our students that. So you wanna, you know, when you're doing compressions and you guys can come up here and practice if you want, but just go right above it and lock your elbows. Don't let them bend, because if I do this, it's kind of funky. Okay, um, you can feel their breastplate right here. You don't want to go down below their, their breasts, so right in the middle of their chest is where you're going to do it. Okay, 
because you got this little bone right here. If you go too low, it could puncture right in there. So you don't want to do that. If you happen to have yeah. equipment if, available. If you're a MacGyver and you got this, <laughs> you could do, you know, we could do a bag. This is bag mass ventilation. I could do this so I could get, have a good seal. This generally would hook up to oxygen, but of course you're not going to have an oxygen tank. This is room air, which is 21% oxygen, thereabouts. It's better than nothing. But if you don't have this and you're like, I'm not going to put my mouth on this person's. As long as you're doing chest compressions, you're pumping the blood, okay? And that's the main thing to do. Um, the other thing too is if you're, if you happen to, to be there and doing this on a person and you call 911 and someone else is there, you can ask them to look for an AED. An AED is an automatic external defibrillator. There's a few here on campus, I think two or three, I'm not for sure. You guys may have seen where they're located. I think there may be a blue light or something, but there's a sign, I believe, like this. They're located, if you go to the mall, they're there. If you go to the airports, they're around, okay? These things are foolproof because all you gotta do is turn it on and it pretty much tells you what to do, okay? So there's electrodes, there's these little uh, tapes that you put on their chest and it has pictures of where to put them, okay? So you're gonna have to, you know, take off their shirt, rip it off or whatever, and put it on them, okay? Um, for females, just take off their blouse or shirt and put it, you don't have to take off their bra or anything like that. For us guys, you know, if, it, if we have a hairy chest, you know, you may have to, you know, they shave it. Some of them have a little razor, you can shave it real quick. Others, they say you can put these on there and kind of give them a quick wax job and rip it off and then get another one and put it on there. If you ever watch 40 year old virgin, <laughs> so, but this is pretty much what they, what they look like. It tells you where to put it. You gotta turn it, the first thing with AED is turn it on, okay? There's an on off switch. I don't know if this one will work or not. I think it's just for training. But you turn it on, and these tell you what to do. Okay, connect the electrodes. So you connect this thing right in there. And then attach it'll say like attach the pads. Maybe it works. Analyzing heart rhythms. Yeah. Do not touch the patient. So I would have my pads on them. Yeah. And then you just sit back. And let it do its thing. Shock advised. Charging. Stay clear of patient. Yeah, if you're ever. You don't want to touch. shock now. Press so, the orange button now. So put your hand on that electrode and let me shoot the shot. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, don't you? Shock delivered. So what you don't want to do is. Analyzing heart rhythm. So it's do analyzing. Touch the patient. See, it's telling you what to do. Okay. These ones, the ones that are here on campus, I'm not sure if Shock they're advised. similar to this. Charging. They're pro it probably is. Stay clear of patient. There's one located in the Childers and the Hillside's building on yeah. the fourth floor. It's and on the fourth floor because they see service a lot of the public with the dental hygiene clinic. And so, and then this semester, there's gonna be a map coming out to show you exactly in what building where the AEDs are located. So be looking for that this semester um, for more AED information. And it'll tell you, you know, it'll say like that one, you know, continue CPR or, you know, don't touch the patient analyzing and you don't touch them, you stop the CPR and then you just follow what, the, what it prompts you to do. It says deliver a shock, deliver a shock, continue CPR, you continue CPR. The one thing with the defibrillator is um, it's going it, to, patients that are in cardiac arrest have an abnormal rhythm, so it's going to shock them back into a normal rhythm. That's what it does. So if you guys remember, like I was born in 70, there used to be that show, Emergency 911, and then I think the trauma, was it the trauma where they would they'd get the shockers? And you would think back then that, oh, okay, this person's not doing anything, let's shock them. If there's nothing there, there's nothing to shock, okay? So if there's no heart rhythm or anything, it's not gonna bring them back. It's not like Frankenstein or anything. So the AED is the most important thing. 
if you can get that. If you don't, then just do compressions. Just do compressions. But if someone says, hey, I got an AAV, cool, let's hook it up. I think one of the hardest things if you have to use an AED is going to be able to discipline yourself to control your mind to focus on the AED and listen to it and follow it. And if it says shock, shock, because I mean that it, that's something you don't take lightly, but at the same time, this person needs the shock. And so don't be scared. You know, I don't want to shock them. That's what they need. And so just being able to calm yourself down in that moment and focus on, okay, I've got to sit still, it's analyzing. Sometimes, you know, we don't like to sit still. We want to just constantly do and we're trying to help and we're panicking and we think we're not doing anything. You got to focus on what the AED is telling you to do because like John, I've done CPR out in the field in people's homes um, the last time I did CPR was on a family member. So, I mean, it's going to catch you when you're not expecting it. And so you try to ingrain this stuff in your brain so that you can pull it out. Even when you're shaking and you're nervous and you're maybe emotionally connected to this person, maybe you're not, um, you got to be able to have that immediate information recall. So just trying to focus and listen and so we've got like well it's no time left. No if you want to <laughs> practice, go for it. Practice. How do you know when you've got an anxiety attack? <laughs> I had to call 911 for two anxiety attacks that where they just passed out on the floor. And my question then is, how do you know if it's not something else, or do you need to, when do you call 911? If they pass out, watch them, see if they're breathing, look at their chest. Yeah, yeah they were breathing. Then, if they're breathing, and then you can, you know, touch them. Hey, are you okay? Are you okay? No. Uh, if they're not coming back to you, I would feel for a pulse. And you know, you can test your pulse right here, two fingers, you can feel for it. If you can't feel that, then you may need to start compressions because they're not, they don't have a heartbeat. And yeah. they're gonna quit breathing if they are breathing. They're probably not breathing at a regular rate. But if this person's passed out, they're gonna need a, a 911 anyway. Yeah. But um, you may, you're gonna have to watch them, you may have to start CPR.